On the afternoon of June 5th, the Allied airborne troopers began dressing for battle. Each rifleman carried his ML, 160 rounds of ammunition, two fragmentation hand grenades, a white phosphorus and an orange-coloured smoke grenade, and a gammon grenade. Most carried a pistol. The paratroopers' greatest fear was getting shot out of the sky. Next was being caught on the ground at the moment of landing, before they could put their rifles into operation, plus a knife and a bayonet. An unwelcome surprise was an order to carry a Mark IV anti-tank mine, weighing about ten pounds. The only place to fit it was in the musette bag, which led to considerable bitching and rearrangement of loads. Machine gunners carried their weapons broken down and extra belts of ammunition. Mortars, bazookas and radios were rolled into A5 equipment bundles with cargo chutes attached. Every man carried three days' worth of field rations and, of course, two or three cartons of cigarettes. One sergeant carried along a baseball. He wrote on it, To hell with you, Hitler, and said he intended to drop it when his plane got over France and he did. There were gas masks, an ideal place to carry an extra carton of cigarettes. The men had first aid kits with bandages, sulphur tablets and two morphine sirets, one for pain and two for eternity. They were also handed a child's toy cricket with the instructions that it could be used in lieu of the normal challenge and password. One click-click was to be answered with two click-clicks. Pathfinders would go first to mark the drop zone with a gadget called the Eureka or Rebecca radar beacon system, which could send a signal up to the lead C-47 in each flight. CPL Frank Brumbaugh, a Pathfinder with the 508th PIR, had not only the 65-pound Eureka to carry, but two containers with carrier pigeons. After he set up his Eureka, he was supposed to make a note to that effect and put it in the capsule on the first pigeon's leg, then turn it loose. He was told to release the second pigeon at 0630 with information on how things were going. But when he got to the marshalling area, he discovered he had no way to feed or water the pigeons, so he let them go. Stripped, Brumbaugh weighed 137 pounds. With all his equipment, including his main and reserve chutes, he weighed 315 pounds. Around 20 hours, Axis Sally came on the radio. Good evening, 82nd Airborne Division, she said. Tomorrow morning, the blood from your guts will grease the bogey wheels on our tanks. It bothered some of the men. Others reassured them. She had been saying something similar for the previous ten days. Still, it made men think. When every man was ready, the regiments gathered around their commanders for a last word. Most COs stuck to basics, assemble quickly was the main point, but one or two added a pep talk. As Lieutenant Carl Cartledge described Johnson's talk, he gave a great battle speech saying victory and liberation and death to the enemy and some of us would die and peace cost a price and so on. Then he said, I want to shake the hand of each one of you tonight, so line up. And with that, he reached down, pulled his knife from his boot and raised it high above his head, promising us in a battle cry, Before the dawn of another day, I'll sink this knife into the heart of the foulest stupids in Nazi land. A resounding yell burst forth from all two thousand of us as we raised our knives in response. After the regimental meetings, the companies grouped around their COs and platoon leaders for a final word. The officers gave out the challenge, password and response. Flash, thunder and welcome. At about 19 Tai Cheng hours, General Eisenhower paid a visit to the 101st Airborne Division at Greenham Common. He circulated among the men, ostensibly to boost their morale. Eisenhower told Captain L. Legs, Johnson. I've done all I can, now it is up to you. He told a group of enlisted men not to worry, that they had the best equipment and leaders in the world, with a vast force coming in behind them. A surgeon from Texas piped up, Hell, we ain't worried, General. It's the Krauts that ought to be worrying now. Eisenhower then asked Strobel if he was ready. Strobel replied that they had all been well prepared, well briefed, and were ready. He added that he thought it wouldn't be too much of a problem. Someone called out, Now quit worrying, General. We'll take care of this thing for you. 
At approximately 22 Sioux hours, as the daylight began to fade, the order rang out, Shoot up! Each man began the tedious task of buckling on his parachutes and trying to find an empty place to hang or tie on the small mountain of equipment he was carrying into combat. They marched to their planes and got their first look at the C-47's war paint, three bands of white painted around the fuselage and wings. The 505th was at Spanho Airfield. As Schultz was lining up to be helped into his C-47, he heard an explosion. A gammon grenade carried by one of the men of Headquarters Company, 1st Battalion, had gone off. It set fire to the plane and killed three men, wounding ten others. Two unhurt survivors were assigned to another plane. They both died in combat before dawn. A bit shaken, Schultz found his place on the Plane, and the first thing I did was reach for my rosary. Having been raced a Catholic boy, I had great faith in the efficacy of prayers to the Blessed Mother. Eisenhower was out on the runway, calling out, Good luck! He noticed a short private, in Eisenhower's words, more equipment than soldier, who snapped him a salute. Eisenhower returned it. Then the private turned to the east and called out, Look out, Hitler! Here we come! The pilots started their engines. A giant cacophony of sound engulfed the airfield as each C-47 in its turn lurched into line on the taxi strip. At the head of the runway, the pilots locked the brakes and ran up the engines until they screamed. Then, at ten-second intervals, they released the brakes and started down the runway, slowly at first, gathering speed, so overloaded that they barely made it into the sky. When the last plane roared off, Eisenhower turned to his driver, Kay Summersby. She saw tears in his eyes. He began to walk slowly toward his car. Well, he said quietly, it's on. Before going to bed, Admiral Ramsey made a final entry in his handwritten diary. Monday, June 5th, 1944. Thus has been made the vital and crucial decision to stage the great enterprise which I hope be the immediate means of bringing about the downfall of Germany's fighting power, a Nazi oppression and an early cessation of hostilities. I am not under delusions as to the risks involved in this most difficult of all operations. Success will be in the balance. We must trust in our invisible assets to tip the balance in our favour. We shall require all the help that God can give us, and I cannot believe that this will not be forthcoming. Tired as he must have been, Ramsay caught the spirit and soul of the great undertaking perfectly, especially in his hope for what the results would be for occupied Europe and the world, his recognition that the enterprise was fraught with peril and his confidence that God was blessing this cause. The Pathfinders went in first. They preceded the main body of troops by an hour or so. Their mission was to mark the drop zones with automatic direction finder radios, eureka sets, and holophane lights formed into T's on the ground. But a cloud bank forced pilots to either climb above it or get below it, so the Pathfinders jumped from too high or too low an altitude. Further anti-aircraft fire coming from the ground caused pilots to take evasive action, throwing them off course. As a consequence, of the 18 American Pathfinder teams, only one landed where it was supposed to. One team landed in the channel. Sergeant Elmo Jones of the 505th PIR jumped at 300 feet or so. Just before exiting the C-47, he said a brief prayer. Lord, thy will be done. But if I'm to die, please help me die like a man. His chute popped open. He looked up to check the canopy, and just that quick his feet hit the ground. It was a soft landing. His chute settled over his head. And the first thing that I thought without even trying to get out of my parachute was, damn, I just cracked the Atlantic wall. Jones assembled his team, got the seven men with the lights in place for their tea told them not to turn on until they could hear the planes coming in, set up his radio and began sending out his ADF signal. He was one of the few pathfinders in the right place. Meiji John Howard's D Company of the Ox and Bucks was the first to go into action as a unit. Glider pilot Sergeant Jim Walwork put his horser glider down exactly where Howard wanted it to land, beside the Orne Canal Bridge. Lit Brotheridge led 1st Platoon over the bridge. 
the horsers carrying second and third platoons landed right behind wall work. Within minutes, the men secured the area around the bridge, routing about 50 German defenders in the process. Two other platoons landed near the Orne River Bridge and secured it. By 021, June 6, five minutes after landing, D Company had taken its objectives. It was a brilliant feat of arms. As the pathfinders were setting up and Howard's men were carrying out their coup de main operation, the 1350-400 American and nearly 7,000 British paratroopers were coming on. The Americans were following a precise route, marked at 10-mile intervals with Eureka sets and at 30-mile intervals with aerial beacons over England. 30 miles over the channel, a British patrol boat, Gallop, marked the path. It was 30 additional miles to checkpoint Hoboken, marked by a light from a British submarine. At that point, the aircraft made a sharp turn to the southeast, crossed between the Channel Islands of Jersey and Guernsey, and headed toward their drop zones in the Cotentin. All planes were maintaining radio silence, so none of the pilots were forewarned by the Pathfinder groups about the cloud bank over the Cotentin. In the Dakotas, the men prepared themselves for the jump in which troubles begin after they hit the ground. The flight over England and out over the Channel was a period, two hours and more, that came between the end of training, preparation and briefing and the beginning of combat. F Dwayne Burns of the 508th PIR recalled, Here we sat, each man alone in the dark. These men around me were the best friends I will ever know. I wondered how many would die before the sun came up. Lord, I pray, please let me do everything right. Don't let me get anybody killed and don't let me get killed either. I really think I'm too young for this. Fit Ken Russell of the 505th had just made it onto his C-47. Two weeks earlier he had been running a high fever, a result of his vaccinations, and was sent to a hospital. On June 4th he still had a high fever, but like everyone else, I had been looking forward to D-Day since 1940, when I was still in grammar school. Now I was so afraid I would miss it. He begged his way out of the hospital and managed to rejoin his company on June 5th. Flying over the channel, he was struck by the thought that his high school class back in Tennessee was graduating that night. Part Harry Reisenleiter of the 508th PR recalled, I guess we all made some rash promises to God. He said that so far as he could tell everyone was afraid, fear of being injured yourself, fear of having to inflict injury on other people to survive, and the most powerful feeling of all, fear of being afraid. The pilots were afraid. For most of the pilots of Troop Carrier Command, this was their first combat mission. They had not been trained for night flying or for flak or bad weather. Their C-47s were designed to carry cargo or passengers, they were neither armed nor armoured. Their gas tanks were neither protected nor self-sealing. The possibility of a mid-air collision was on every pilot's mind. The pilots were part of a gigantic air armada. It took 432 C-47s to carry the 101st Airborne to Normandy, about the same number for the 82nd. They were flying in a V of V's formation, stretched out across the sky, 300 miles long, nine planes wide, without radio communication. Only the lead pilot in each serial of 45 had a Eureka set, with a show of lights from the plexiglass astrodome for guidance for the following planes. The planes were 100 feet from wingtip to wingtip in their groups of nine, 1,000 feet from one group to another, with no lights except little blue dots on the tail of the plane ahead. That was a tight formation for night flying in planes that were 65 feet long and 95 feet from wingtip to wingtip. They crossed the channel at 500 feet or less to escape German radar detection, then climbed to 1,500 feet to escape anti-aircraft batteries on the Channel Islands. As they approached the Cotentin coast, they descended to 600 feet or so, the designated jump altitude. When they crossed the coastline, they hit the cloud bank and lost their visibility altogether. The pilots instinctively separated, some descending, some rising, all peeling off to the right or left to avoid a mid-air collision. When they emerged from the clouds, within seconds or at the most minutes, they were hopelessly separated. 
Lieutenant Harold Young of the 326th Parachute Engineers recalled that as his plane came out of the clouds, we were all alone. I remember my amazement. Where had all those C-47s gone? Simultaneously, to use the words of many of the pilots, all hell broke loose. Searchlights, tracers and explosions filled the sky. Pilot Sidney Ulan of the 99th Troop Carrier Squadron was chewing gum. And the saliva in my mouth completely dried up from the fright. It seemed almost impossible to fly through that wall of fire without getting shot down, but I had no choice. There was no turning back. They could speed up, which most of them did. They were supposed to throttle back to 90 miles per hour or less to reduce the opening shock for the paratroopers. But 90 miles per hour at 600 feet made them easy targets for the Germans on the ground, so they pushed the throttle forward and sped up to 150 miles per hour. Meanwhile, either descending to 300 feet or climbing to 2,000 feet and more. They twisted and turned, spilling their passengers and cargo. They got hit by machine gun fire, 20 mm shells, and the heavier 80 mm shells. They saw planes going down to their right and left, above and below them. They saw planes explode. They had no idea where they were, except that they were over the Cotentin. The pilots had turned on the red lights over the doors when they crossed the Channel Islands. That was the signal to the jump masters to order their men to stand up and hook up. The pilots turned on the green light when they guessed that they were somewhere near the drop zone. That was the signal to go. Many troopers saw planes below them as they jumped. At least one plane was hit by an equipment bundle. It tore off almost three feet of wingtip. Virtually every plane got hit by something. One pilot broke radio silence to call out in desperation. I've got a paratrooper hung up on my wing. Another pilot came on the air with advice. Slow down and he'll slide off. In this frightful madness of gunfire and sky mixed with parachuting men and screaming planes, pilot Chuck Ratliff remembered, we found we had missed the drop zone and were now back out over the water. We were dumbfounded. What to do? Ratliff turned that sucker around and circled back. He dropped to 600 feet. The jump master pressed his way into the cockpit to help locate the drop zone. He saw what he thought was it. We pulled back throttles to a semi-stall, Ratliff said. Hit the green light and the troopers jumped out into the black night. We dove that plane to a hundred feet off the ground and took off for England, full bore, like a scalded dog. Sergeant Charles Bortsfield of the 100th Troop Carrier Squadron was standing near the jump door, wearing a headset for the intercom radio, passing on information to the jump master. As the green light went on, he was hit by shrapnel. As he fell from four wounds in his arm and hand, he broke his leg. One trooper asked him, just before jumping, Are you hit? I think so, Bortsfield replied. Me too, the trooper called over his shoulder as he leapt into the night. In the body of the planes, the troopers were terrified, not at what was ahead of them, but because of the hopeless feeling of getting shot at and tumbled around and being unable to do anything about it. As the planes twisted and turned, climbed or dove, many sticks were thrown to the floor in a hopeless mess of arms, legs and equipment. Meanwhile, bullets were ripping through the wings and fuselage. Out the open doors, the men could see tracers sweeping by in graceful slow-motion arcs. They were orange, red, blue, yellow. They were frightening, mesmerising, beautiful. Most troopers who tried to describe the tracers used some variation of the greatest Fourth of July fireworks display I ever saw. They add that when they remembered that only one in six of the bullets coming up at them were tracers, they couldn't see how they could possibly survive the jump. For Pitt William True of the 506th, it was unbelievable that there were people down there, shooting at me, trying to kill Bill True. The pilots turned on the red light and the jump master shouted the order, Stand up and hook up. The men hooked the lines attached to the backpack covers of their main chutes to the anchor line running down the middle of the top of the fuselage. Sound off for equipment check. From the rear of the plane would come the call, 16 OK, then 15 OK, and so on. The men in the rear began pressing forward. They knew the Germans were waiting for them 
but never in their lives had they been so eager to jump out of an airplane. Let's go, let's go, they shouted, but the jump masters held them back, waiting for the green light. My plane was bouncing like something gone wild, for Dwayne Burns of the 508th remembered. I could hear the machine gun rounds walking across the wings. It was hard to stand up and troopers were falling down and getting up. Some were throwing up. Of all the training we had, there was not anything that had prepared us for this. In training, the troopers could anticipate the green light. Before the pilot turned it on, he would throttle back and raise the tail of the plane. Not this night. Most pilots throttled forward and began to dive. Dutch, Schultz and every man in his stick fell to the floor. They regained their feet and resumed shouting, Let's go! Sergeant Dan Furlong's plane got hit by three 88 Militus shells. The first struck the left wing, taking about three feet off the tip. The second hit alongside the door and knocked out the light panel. The third came up through the floor. It blew a hole about two feet across, hit the ceiling and exploded, creating a hole four feet around, killing three men and wounding four others. Furlong recalled, Basically the Krauts just about cut that plane in half. I was in the back, assistant jumpmaster. I was screaming, let's go. The troopers, including three of the four wounded men, dove headfirst out of the plane. The pilot was able to get control of the plane and head back for the nearest base in England for an emergency landing. The fourth wounded man had been knocked unconscious. When he came to over the channel, he was delirious. He tried to jump out. The crew chief had to sit on him until they landed. On planes, still flying more or less on the level, when the green light went on, the troopers set a record for exiting. Still, many of them remembered all their lives, their thoughts as they got to the door and leaped out. Eager as they were to go, the sky full of tracers gave them pause. Port John Fitzgerald of the 502nd had taken a cold shower every morning for two years to prepare himself for this moment. Port Arthur de Filippo of the 505th could see the tracers coming straight at him, and all I did was pray to God that he would get me down safely and then I would take care of myself. Piff John Taylor of the 508th was appalled when he got to the door. His plane was so low that his thought was, We don't need a parachute for this. All we need is a stepladder. When Piffit Len Griffin of the 501st got to the door, I looked out into what looked like a solid wall of tracer bullets. I remember this as clearly as if it happened this morning. It's engraved in the cells of my brain. I said to myself, Len, you're in as much trouble now as you're ever going to be. If you get out of this, nobody can ever do anything to you that you ever have to worry about. At that instant, an 88 Mifit a shell hit the left wing, and the plane went into a sharp roll. Griffin was thrown to the floor, then managed to pull himself up and leap into the night. Most of the sticks jumped much too low from planes going much too fast. The opening shock was intense. In hundreds, if not thousands of cases, the troopers swung once, then hit the ground. Others jumped from too high up. For them it seemed an eternity before they hit the ground. Because of the way his plane rolled, Private Griffin's stick was badly separated. The man who went before him was a half-mile back. The man who jumped after Griffin was a half-mile forward. My chute popped open and I was the only parachute in the sky. It took me one hundred years to get down. Below him, a German flak wagon with four 20 Mimiton guns was pumping out shells, and I was the only thing they had to shoot at. Tracers went under me and I couldn't help but pull my legs up. The flak wagon kept shooting at him even after he hit the ground. I would have been hit through sheer Teutonic perseverance if the next flight of planes hadn't arrived and they gave up shooting at me to shoot at them. Pert Fitzgerald Looked up to check my canopy and watched in detached amazement as bullets ripped through my chute. I was mesmerised by the scene around me. Every colour of the rainbow was flashing through the sky. Equipment bundles attached to chutes that did not fully open came hurtling past me. Helmets that had been ripped off by the opening shock. Troopers floated past. Below me, figures were running in all directions. 
I thought, Christ, I'm going to land right in the middle of a bunch of Germans. My chute floated into the branches of an apple tree and dumped me to the ground with a thud. The trees were in full bloom and added a strange sweet scent to this improbable scene. To Fitzgerald's relief, the Germans turned out to be cows running for cover. I felt a strange surge of elation. I was alive. The 506th was supposed to land ten kilometres or so southwest of saint Eglise, but a couple of sticks from the regiment came down in the town. It was Euro 115. A small hay barn on the south side of the church square was on fire, evidently caused by a tracer. Mayor Alexandre Renault had called out the residents to form a bucket brigade to get water from the town pump to the fire. The German garrison sent out a squad to oversee the infraction of the curfew. Within a few minutes, it was quiet again over saint mer Eglise. On the ground, the firefighting effort resumed. But the German guards were now alert for any further paratroop drops. Sergeant Carwood Lipton and Lit Dick Winters of Company E, 506th, landed on the outskirts of the town. Lipton figured out where they were by reading the signpost in the moonlight, one letter at a time. Winters gathered together a group of squad size or less and began hiking for his company's objective, Stay Marie Dumont. Winters did not know it, but his CO was dead. Letter Thomas Meehan and Headquarters Company had been flying in the lead plane in Stick 66. It was hit with bullets going through it and out the top, throwing sparks. The plane maintained course and speed for a moment or two, then did a slow wing over to the right. Pilot Frank de Flitter, just behind, remembered that the plane's landing lights came on and it appeared they were going to make it when the plane hit a hedgerow and exploded. There were no survivors. Sergeant McCallum, one of the pathfinders for the 506th, was on the ground about ten kilometres from saint marie du mont The Germans had anticipated that the field he was in might be used as a drop zone, so they had machine guns and mortars around three sides of it. On the fourth side, they had soaked a barn with kerosene. When the planes carrying Captain Charles Shettle and his company came overhead and the men started jumping out, the Germans set a torch to the barn. It lit up the whole area. As the troopers came down, the Germans commenced firing. Sergeant McCallum said, I'll never forget the sadness in my heart as I saw my fellow troopers descend into this death trap. Captain Shettle got down safely despite mortar shells exploding and tracer bullets crisscrossing the field. Shettle was Battalion S3. The company he had jumped with was supposed to assemble at the barn, but that was obviously impossible. Shettle moved quickly to the alternate assembly point and began blowing his whistle. In a half hour he had 50 men around him, but only 15 were from the 506th. The others were members of the 501st. That kind of confusion and mixing of units was going on all over the cotton tea. A single company, E of the 506th, had men scattered from Carantan to Ravenoville, a distance of 20 kilometres. Men of the 82nd were in the 101st drop zone and vice versa. Standard drill for the paratroopers, practised countless times, was to assemble by rolling up the stick. The first men out would follow the line of flight of the airplane. The men in the middle would stay put. The last men out would move in the opposite direction from the airplane's route. In practice manoeuvres, it worked well. In combat that night, it worked only for a fortunate few. At 0145 hours, 27 of the 36 sticks of the battalion either hit the drop zone or landed within a mile of it. Vandervoort broke his ankle when he landed. He laced his boot tighter, used his rifle as a crutch, verified his location, and began sending up green flares as a signal for his battalion to assemble on him. Within half an hour, he had 600 men around him. No other unit of similar size had so complete an assembly so quickly. The second battalion's mission was to secure neuville au plain just north of saint mer eglise It was a long hike. Vandervoort was much too big a man to be carried. He spotted two sergeants pulling a collapsible ammunition cart. Vandervoort asked if they would mind giving him a lift. One of the sergeants replied that they hadn't come all the way to Normandy to pull any damn colonel around. 
Vandervoort noted later, I persuaded them otherwise. General Taylor was not as fortunate as Vandervoort. The commander of the 101st landed alone, outside saint marie du mont For twenty minutes he wandered around, trying to find his assembly point. He finally encountered his first trooper, a private from the 501st, established identity with his clicker, and hugged the man. A few minutes later, Taylor's aide, Lieutenant Briere, came up. The three-man group wandered around until Taylor, in the dark, physically collided with his artillery commander, Brig, General Anthony McAuliffe. He didn't know where they were either. Breyer pulled out a flashlight, the generals pulled out a map, the three men ducked into a hedgerow, studied the map, and came to three different conclusions as to where they were. Lot Parker Alford and his radio operator joined Taylor's group. By this time it consisted of two generals, a full colonel, three lieutenant colonels, four lieutenants, several NCO radio operators, and a dozen or so privates. Taylor looked around, grinned, and said, Never in the annals of warfare have so few been commanded by so many. He decided to set off in a direction that he hoped would take him to his primary objective, the village of Pooperville, the foot of Causeway 1, lit caller Luis Mendez, commanding the 3rd Battalion of the 508th, was even worse off than Taylor. He jumped at 2,100 feet, which was too much of a ride. I landed about 2.30 and didn't see anybody for five days. In that time, he may have killed more of the enemy than any other lieutenant colonel in the war. I got three heinies with three shots from my pistol, two heinies with a carbine, and one heinie with a hand grenade. He estimated that he walked 90 miles across the western Cottentan looking for another American, without success. At La Madeleine, in his blockhouse, lit Arthur Yanke was confused. The airplanes overhead did not particularly worry him, even though the numbers of planes flying through the night were greater than usual. But what was the meaning of the bursts of automatic and machine gun fire he was hearing to his rear? Yankee alerted his men, doubled the guards, and ordered a patrol to go out and reconnoitre. Simultaneously, Pit Louis Merlano of the 101st, second man in his stick, landed on the dunes a few metres away from Yankee's position. Horrified, he heard the cries of eleven of his comrades as they fell into the channel and drowned. Half an hour later, the German patrol returned to La Madeleine with 19 American paratroopers, including Milano, picked up on the beach. Delighted with his catch, Janka tried to telephone his battalion commander, but just as he began to report, the line went dead. A paratrooper somewhere inland had cut the line. Jahanke locked his prisoners into a pillbox and placed a guard in front of it. At 04, Suicho, the guard came to inform him that the prisoners were nervous and kept insisting that they be transferred to the rear. Janke could not understand. There would be a low tide at dawn, and Rommel had told him the Allies would only come on a high tide. What were the captured men afraid of? In saint omer Eglise, the fire was raging out of control. The men of the 506th who had landed in and near the town had scattered. At 0145, the second platoon of F Company, 505th, had the bad luck to jump right over the town where the German garrison was fully alerted. Ken Russell was in that stick. Coming down, he recalled, I looked to my right and I saw this guy, and instantaneously he was blown away. There was just an empty parachute coming down. Evidently, a shell had hit his gammon grenades. Horrified, Russell looked to his left. He saw another member of his stick, Pitt Charles Blankenship, being drawn into the fire. I heard him scream once, then again before he hit the fire, and he didn't scream any more. The Germans filled the sky with tracers. Russell was trying to hide behind my reserve chute because we were all sitting ducks. He got hit in the hand. He saw Let Harold Kaddish and Pertz, H.T. Bryant and Ladislaw Tlapa land on telephone poles around the church square. The Germans shot them before they could cut themselves loose. It was like they were crucified there. Russell jerked on his risers to avoid the fire and came down on the slate roof of the church. I hit and a couple of my suspension lines went around the church steeple and I slid off the roof. He was hanging off the edge. And Steele, John Steele, he came down and his chute covered the steeple. 
Steele was hit in the foot. Sergeant John Ray landed in the church square just past Russell and Steele. A German soldier came around the corner. I'll never forget him, Russell related. He was red-haired, and as he came around he shot Sergeant Ray in the stomach. Then he turned toward Russell and Steele and brought his machine pistol up to shoot them. And Sergeant Ray, while he was dying in agony, he got his forty-five out and he shot the German soldier in the back of the head and killed him. Through all this the church bell was constantly ringing. Russell could not remember hearing the bell. He scared to death, managed to reach his trench knife and cut himself loose. He fell to the ground and dashed across the street and the machine gun fire was knocking up pieces of earth all around me and I ran over into a grove of trees on the edge of town and I was the loneliest man in the world. Strange country and just a boy. I should have been graduating from high school rather than in a strange country. There was a flak wagon in the grove, shooting at passing Dakotas. I got my gammon grenade out and I threw it on the gun and the gun stopped. He moved away from town. A German soldier on a bicycle came down the road. Russell shot him. Then he found an American from the 101st. Russell asked, Do you know where you are? No, the trooper replied. They set out to find someone who did know. T. James Eads of the 82nd landed in an enormous manure pile, typical of Normandy. At least it was a soft landing. Three German soldiers came out of the farmhouse and ran toward him. Oh hell, Eads said to himself, out of the frying pan into a latrine, now this. His rifle was still strapped to his chest. He couldn't get out of his harness. Eads pulled his forty-five, thumbed back the hammer and started firing. The first two men fell, the third kept coming. Eads had one bullet left. He dropped the last man right at his feet. Still stuck in his harness in the manure, Eads was trying to cut himself loose when a German machine gun opened up on him. Damn, he said aloud, is the whole Kraut army after me, just one scared red-headed trooper? Bullets ripped into his musette bag. He tried to bury himself in the manure. He heard an explosion and the firing stopped. He cut himself loose and began moving. He heard a noise behind him, decided to take a chance, and snapped his cricket. Two answering clicks came back at once. I could have kissed him, Eads recalled. His first words were, I got those over-anxious Kraut machine gunners with a grenade, but it blew off my helmet and I can't find it. Then he took a breath and exclaimed, Holy cow! You stink. For many of the men of the 82nd Airborne, whose drop zones were to the west of saint mer Eglise, astride the Merderay River, there was a special hell. Rommel had ordered the locks near the mouth of the river, down by Carentan, opened at high tide, closed at low tide, so as to flood the valley. Because the grass had grown above the flooded area, Allied air reconnaissance photographs failed to reveal the trap. The water generally was not more than a metre deep, but that was deep enough to drown an overloaded paratrooper who couldn't get up or cut himself out of his harness. Among them was Perfort Paul Bouchereau, a Louisiana Cajun. He was taken to a German command post where other POWs were being harshly interrogated. The German captain, speaking English, was demanding to know how many Americans had jumped into the area. Millions and millions of us, one GI replied. The angry captain asked Bouchereau the same question. With his strong Cajun accent, Bouchereau answered, Just me. Furious, the captain had the Americans clasp their hands over their heads and march them off, under guard. After a few minutes, for no apparent reason, the German sergeant in charge opened fire on his prisoners with his machine pistol. I can still recall his appearance, Bouchereau said. He was short and stocky and mean-looking. His most striking feature was a scar on the right side of his face. Bouchereau was hit near his left knee. It felt like a severe bee sting. The German sergeant calmed down and the march resumed. Bouchereau tried to keep up despite the squish of blood in his boot with every other step. He fell to the ground. A kraut came over and rolled me on my back. He cocked his rifle and put the business end to my head. I set a speed record for saying the rosary, but instead of pulling the trigger, the German laughed, 
then bent over and offered me an American cigarette. I suppose I should have been grateful that my life had been spared, but instead I was furious at the physical and mental torture to which I had been subjected. My mind and heart were filled with hate. I dreamed of the day when I would repay them in full measure for my suffering.